Okay, hello, my name is Emily Arthur and I am an associate professor at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. And I've been invited tonight to uh, moderate a studio artist talk with Adriana Barrios and it's being hosted and online by the Arts Literature Lab. And the Arts Literature Laboratory is a community-driven contemporary arts center supporting the visual, literary, and performing arts. The president of the All Board and co-director is Jolyn Boorda, and she brings together all of the resources, people, and space to empower artists and writers to take risks and transcend the formal boundaries. And I'm really grateful to Jolyn for all the work that she's done in our community and through all and for this um, artist studio talk tonight with Adriana. Um, as we uh, present the different um, questions and I'll be asking Adriana some questions. If you also have questions that you wanna post in the chat, then we will have um, time to get to all the questions in the last uh, 10 or 15 minutes. And I just wanna welcome you to this conversation with Adriana and um, introduce her. And I, I'm unclear about the format, but I can see Adriana. And Adriana, thank you so much for asking me to be here with you tonight. And I also wanna thank um, Jim, who is behind the scenes operating the um, technology for us. So thank you both so much. And I have the privilege of knowing Adriana for several years, um, both as a grad student and now in her professional career. And um, so uh, she's given me a wonderful bio to share with you. Adriana is a queer biracial Latina artist who grew up on the coastal borderlands of San Diego, California. Adriana received her BFA from the University of Texas at San Antonio and her MFA from the University of Wisconsin-Madison within the printmaking area. Adriana has exhibited her work internationally in Italy and Mexico and nationally in New York, New Mexico, and Texas. Her work is in the permanent collections of UW-Madison Graduate School and UW-Madison Department of Special Collections. She is one of the two recipients this year in 2020-2021 Women Artist Forward Prize. Um, and over the summer, she will be an innovation and image resident at the Pilchuck Glass School located in Washington. And um, just as a, um, another comment about Adriana's um, success as a professional practicing artist is the incredible work that um, she has done in earning this Forward Art Prize, which is an annual unrestricted award for two women in Madison in the visual arts who are actually in Dane County. And I personally just want to thank uh, the work that Brenda Baker and Bird Ross have done for women in the arts in, the, in Dane County. So thank you. Um, also, you can um, find Adriana's work on her website, which will also be posted in the chat. So I am going to um, hope that the screen will switch now over to Adriana. And um, Adriana, will you please let us know um, how you became involved with Arts Literature Lab and what is your role there? Sure, yeah, Emily, first off, um, thank you so much for being here with me today. Um, it really means so, lot, uh, so much to me to, um, to be in this conversation with you. And um, thank you to everyone at all for this invitation and for everyone who has been part of um, putting these artist talks together. Um, so yeah, so I am a studio artist at all. I moved into my studio space, I think it was last summer um, during the pandemic. Um, I'm also on the curatorial board at all. Um, I became familiar with uh, the work that all was doing for the arts in Madison during my time in grad school. Um, I'd spent um, time going to events and exhibitions at the old location and was just really excited about the energy and the programming that was happening there. Um, and um, the other part of the question was, oh yeah, um, I, I, go ahead, sorry. Well, just um, your role at all, but also oh, yeah. you know, it would be great to hear what it means to you to have a studio space there. Right. Um, so I would say for me, it's really about having a, a dedicated workspace for my artwork mm -hmm. um, and also having an affordable space that makes it possible. 
Um, I also want to say that there's something, something to be said about having a space dedicated to your work where you can make your work and at any moment kind of stop and, and leave the space and then come right back you know, the next day or whatever. And you can pick up like right where you left off. And for me, it's helped to create this sort of rhythm and flow that has been really beneficial. Um, and then, you know, the, the community space here is amazing um, to be part of it. It just means so much. Um, and I'm just so excited about being here and uh, being in this beautiful new building. And I cannot wait until we can all celebrate together here. Um, there's just, I know that there was so much planning involved and hard work um, to make this space a reality. And so I can't wait to celebrate with others in it. Yeah, I feel fortunate that I've been able to see it and see your space and it is really exciting. Um, I, I was so glad to see um, your work as it continues to develop. And um, I've had such rich conversations with you about the work and your experiences. And so I'm wondering if you would be willing to share a little bit about um, your early experiences and often as artists were shaped by the people and places, um, you know, as, as in our early life. And um, if you could talk a little bit about that to help us have a better understanding of your perspective. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I was born and raised in San Diego and I, I come from a pretty large family. Um, I'm biracial and I grew up in a, a multi-ethnic family. Uh, my mother's side is white with Swedish heritage and my father is Colombian and my extended family are Mexican and Mexican American. And um, I had the privilege of traveling quite a bit when I was a child and um, specifically to different parts of Mexico and to Colombia. And I would say that these, these trips definitely shaped me and gave me insight um, into who, who I was, who I am, and where I come from. Um, and specifically, I'm thinking about these trips that I would make with my family to Baja. Um, my grandfather had leased a property in a town called uh, Puerto Citos. And it's a coastal town um, in Baja on the Sea of Cortez. And it's really remote. It's in the middle of the desert on a sea. Um, and we would often go there just to be together. But um, one thing that um, we often would do when we would go down there is we would, we would soak in these um, mineral hot springs. And I remember going down there with my, my grandmother and her explaining to us um, that we would eventually need to, to move to a new pool as the tide moved out. And so this early experience of um, the power of the ocean and the ocean tides comes from these, these, these uh, family trips. Um, so while you're sitting in these hot springs, the tide is moving out. And as the tide moves out, these pools become much warmer because of the volcanic rock around them. Um, so really understanding the kind of like physical experience um, and power of, of nature and, and the ocean in, in the, on those trips. Wow, thank you. And do you feel like um, some of these experiences can be seen in the most recent work. Um, I know that you've been producing quite a lot of work um, during the pandemic, and I'm wondering if you'd be willing to share some of that with us. Yeah, sure. Um, I think I will share my screen. Let's see if I can. Yeah, I'll Emily, can you see that? Yes, I can okay, see that. Okay, cool. Okay, so um, this is my studio space and um, this is the most recent uh, piece of artwork that I have completed. Um, it's titled Synchronous Gaze. And this is a, a studio shot of some of the equipment in my studio space um, that I had set up prior to the installation on the frozen lake, which I think happened like a month ago. Um, I think first off, I wanna say that I'm, I'm aware and sensitive about the land and location in the places I make work, artwork in and about. And so I wanna honor um, the, the ancestral, um, the Ho-Chunk, 
that they are the ancestral um, stewards of the land that I live on and make work on. Um, so this particular piece took place at Merrill Springs and on Lake Mendota. The artwork is made up of a video projection which broadcast a pre-recorded open source live feed video made viewable by the International Space Station. And I was really interested in the way that the camera on the space station points down onto the earth, offering this really extraordinary picture. Um, here's a, another, another installation shot. This is my partner, um, Barbara, and I just wanna give a big shout out to her because this installation was pretty intense. It was nine degrees. Um, the day that we installed this, um, this piece on the, the frozen lake. And so the projector screen um, acts as a mirror, allowing the viewer to look back at themselves and the earth by way of the camera's gaze. So I was really interested in how we become both the observer and the spectacle as our eyes watch the world pass by. And I would say this artwork is dependent on the viewer. My intention for the viewer was to see themselves in it. And here's um, a recording that I took while we were on the frozen lake. So the total amount of time that we were on the lake was I think only three hours. Um, the recording started as soon as the sun started to set. And then I'll give you just a preview here of what it looked like a little bit later. And so this piece now um, lives as a video. And my, my hope is that um, I'll get to do this again. And, and due, to, due to COVID, um, people weren't allowed to, to come out and gather. And so it was really myself and Barbara who were, were here with the artwork and, and while in front of it, I realized that, um, that it really um, was about uh, the experience of being in front of it uh, under the stars in the cold, um, surrounded by this environment while looking at this projection. Yeah, it, it really has this incredible just vastness, right? I mean, you just have this open landscape of the frozen lake and then this um, this vast overview of of the globe. You know, it even right. feels, feels bigger than just using the word yeah. world. Yeah. And, um, I love this kind of haunting and immediate recognition of standing in that place and then you're now included in the artwork. It's like on exactly. the ground this groundedness and that you, whether you knew it or not, you know, are, are suddenly a part of it. I think, I think that's such a um, incredible perspective. And I, I'm also just like so aware of the amount of labor that it took for you to have this look so seamless. So thank you, um, Emily. That is one of the things that I think um, <laughs> make look so easy and so <laughs> slick. And once you unpack exactly how these works are made, it, yeah. it's like, I feel like we have to be part like janitor, part like mechanic. Uh, mm. I know, I know you and I've shared like plumbing tricks of, for our for our studios. Like, how do I make this screen washout booth work with right. my plumbing? <laughs> you know, and hours in the aisles of trying to explain to um, the guys at Home Depot what you're doing. <laughs> but, um, but will you give us just a sense of what it was like for yeah. you to carry all this equipment, sure. move it to install it? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it was the it was the, it was the, one of the toughest experiences, um, toughest art projects I've ever um, put together. And to be honest, the makeup of it is actually quite simple. It it exists um, of a projector screen, a projector, a camera that is recording this whole situation, and. Um, a few electrical cords and, oh yeah. And then the, the two sandbags that are holding down the screen from blowing over, which and that didn't about, happen. What about the nine degrees? Situation? Right, yeah, no, it was, it was terrifying. I mean, it was also really risky because 
I mean, I'm from the West Coast where you just don't, you don't, we don't have frozen lakes down in San Diego. <laughs> so <laughs> like experiencing that like never goes away that that whole um, kind of fear of walking on this frozen lake. And <clears throat> I, you know, I had multiple conversation with, conversations with friends convincing me that it was okay. Um, so we, we prepared as much as we could. We layered up, um, we put on all the gear um, and we moved as quickly as we could. And because we were moving so fast, we were sweating. So our bodies stayed quite warm. Um, but no, it was, it was a pretty intense um, production, but I'm super happy with uh, the results and, um, and uh, shout out to everyone um, that was involved with Winter is Alive. Um, Tamsi, Bethany, Karen, um, thank you to Amoka for inviting me to display this recording um, in the gallery downstairs on the monitor. Um, it was a really amazing uh, exhibition to be part of. Wow. And I, I know, you know, you're talking about um, not having frozen lakes in uh, California. And, um, and I, I, I can relate to that experience of, you know, being a guest here in, in, in Wisconsin in a lot of ways um, and uh, um, learning lots of new things in the winter. Um, and I'm wondering what it was like for, with you in conversations um, with the scientists that you're collaborating mm. with in California. Um, because sure. uh, I, I know you're working with him on water and tides and like the way that they're moving. And um, I don't know, I just, I find it so inter fascinating, as you know, um, to, to work with scientists <clears throat> as an artist and see all the similarities in the experimenting and the right. research and the deep questions that don't mm -hmm. ever really get answered. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yes, um, yeah, 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 yeah. I was thinking a lot about that today actually, before our talk. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll just backtrack a little bit and, um, tie that into this particular piece here. So this is also another piece I recently made, um, well, a year ago, April, um, and it was part of the outside looking in the drive-by exhibition at um, the Garber Feed Mill. And <clears throat> this piece was is made up of, of, of two videos. Um, one, and I'll just start playing this one as I talk, um, so the first video is a video that I, I had recorded through my drone. And I think my connection might be a little bad, I'm sorry. <clears throat> See if it catches up. Um, so I had the, the camera on the drone point directly down onto the waves, um, a sort of bird's eye view of the landscape. It's a really sort of hypnotic, repetitive, um, video of waves crashing over and over and over. And then eventually it transitions into, and I'll just um, speed up a little here, <clears throat> into the second video, which was recorded from this live feed camera um, that I've been, I guess you could say, obsessed with. Um, there are all of these live feed cameras posted along the coastline in Southern California. And um, this particular one um, was pointing <clears throat> at this site here, which looks sort of sort of like a construction site, and it is, it was, um, but it was a, it is at Solana Beach, um, right off the Highway 101, and at the time of this recording, let's play a little more. Um, it was part of this coastal st stabilization project called a living shoreline. And I'm interested in the way these live feed cameras sort of keep watch on the coastline. And most of the live feed cameras I've come across are recording 24 seven. And as it records, um, it records these, some, these, these very, some might call mundane moments, but at the same time, I find them to be really interesting and telling um, about the way that we that we treat the land, the way that we interact with the land, the way that we move through um, the places that we live. And 
And woven into these, these live feeds are these really transformative and beautiful moments. <clears throat> and so this was um, one stage of the restoration stabilization um, uh, project um, in Solana Beach um, or Cardiff Beach. And this is, yep. So in, in December of 2018, um, I visited the Living Shoreline Project with um, Robert Guza. And this is a portrait I took of Bob um, when we were on the coast when he took me down to um, visit the Living Shoreline. And Robert is an oceanographer and he's a professor emeritus at UCSD Scripps Institute of Oceanography in San Diego. And Robert has been studying cliff erosion and regional wave networks and wave energy for over, I think it's been like 30 years. And the living shoreline that Robert and I visited was designed to protect, <coughs> excuse me, I'm sorry, to protect Cardiff State Beach, Highway 101 businesses, infrastructure from, um, from coastal flooding and sea level rise, while also, also fostering dune habitat for native plants and animals. This is what the living shoreline looks like as of this past week. And the living shoreline restoration project is, is now complete. Um, I'm, I'm super eager to get back out to, Cal out to California um, and visit the site with Bob. Um, you can see here how close the ocean is and how small these dunes are. Um, and the last time I spoke with Bob about this site, he had mentioned that like a, a heavy rain could take out most of this work here. So um, it still looks like it's holding up pretty well, but uh, I'm really um, eager to, to get out here and, and see it for myself. So Adriana, just to make sure that I have a, a, a really good understanding of this. So, so they're restoring the shoreline by increasing the sand, is that correct? And I feel like I remember you telling me about um, Dr. Guza's work as sand is endangered or like this, this incredible loss of sand. Yeah. Um, how, and right. how, do we, how, do we, how do we restore sand when sand is limited? Yeah, uh, can yeah. You talk about that a little bit or just explain the sure. um, kind of, that sounds very, uh, um, Hard, hard to grasp actually. Sure, sure. So the beaches in Southern California are disappearing. The sand is disappearing. And um, a lot of the work that he's doing is figuring out where that sand is going. Um, just down the way from this beach, the, the sand has been replaced by cobbles, like cobblestones. And so they're also, he's also been studying those. Um, but with, in this particular location, what they're doing is they're basically digging a giant hole. They're filling it with boulders. They put a sort of net down and then they cover it with sand and then plant um, native plants on top of it. And so it's essentially supposed to keep the ocean back. And on a larger scale, if you look at this um, from the sky, say, it's very small in comparison to how powerful the ocean is, right? And I think this project from what I remember was like a three, billion dollar project. And essentially it's protecting mostly this road right here, which is a very, um, as you can see, it's, like, it's a heavily traveled road, but it's also the 101. So the 101 goes all the way from Southern California to from the border to all the way up to Canada. So, um, it's a, it's a bit of a tourist route as well. And I think that's why they spent so much money trying to um, keep it from just like being taken over by the ocean. Does that answer your question? Yeah, it, it does. And um, are these some of the sand samples in the print work that you have? Right. Um, um, I do have some of those images and I thought I would Oops, sorry. Share this. Um, oh, great. So this, 
this doc um, is an example of um, some information that Robert has shared with me. Um, and it shows buoy measurements and numerical model simulations. And the buoy measurements and numerical model sim simulations are used in tandem to forecast wave locations, which are then used to issue warnings of any sort of like street flooding um, for different parts of, of the coast in San Diego. And so I am not an oceanographer, but <laughs> I am fascinated by the work that Robert conducts and the generosity that he's showed me in sharing his research. And when I look at the, the scientific data, I, I see a record of time. I see coastal transformation and I, and I see landscapes. And I think Emily, you're thinking about these images. Um, and I with this particular information, I was directly responding uh, to it in, in, in these prints. And um, this work is titled Measurements of the Sea. And it's an eight and a half by 11 inch um, etching made on handmade paper. And I took gathered sand samples and brought them into the paper making studio with me and I mixed it with the pulp. And then I later printed an etching that was constructed from these direct drawings that were referencing um, the wave forecast data. And in these works, I've taken the scientific data with my direct experience on the coast and incorporated it into the paper making, the printmaking, and the installation. And yeah, I, I sometimes I'm just overwhelmed at the kind of um, big picture, you know, global perspective, and then the really refined. Um, technical process that you have to have experience with and knowledge with in the studio to carry out etchings in particular and photopolymer, photo etchings that you're working with um, and screen print. So on the one hand, Adriana, you have this like um, real craft and skill in the process of printmaking, which is so based in materials and labor and you know the physicality of all the copper and the ink and in this case the pulp the paper pulp and paper making um and then you have this relationship between the materials and process of printmaking into this like technology of video and drones and microscopes and i, I just am really interested in um kind of these these two that you've mashed up together um, and if you would talk a little bit about this relationship to the use of technology, whether it's in the print shop or, um, gosh, I don't even know how to explain the other levels of technology in terms of the, the drones and, and video and microscopes, but could you speak to that a little bit? Sure, sure, yeah. So I think that the technology allows me to make work about a place that I am not physically in. And I'm really interested in process and technique. Um, I love learning new ways of, of making and sort of challenging the possibilities and limitations of the, the techniques I, I might know pretty well. Um, and I'm just gonna share my screen again. So I'll often use photography, both analog or digital, as a way of documentation. I look at it as a way of record keeping, um, specifically when I'm like in a place on, a, on site. Um, and it's an easy way to record um, quickly, um, if, if I'm using a digital camera, it is anyway. Um, I also see photography as a way of remembering a place and as a way of returning to a place that I am not physically near. I'll often use photographs directly in prints um, with photopolymer, screen prints, or lithography. And these prints, <clears throat> this particular print and the next view 
are a recent series titled uh, Coastal Collision that I made um, last April, I think it was, um, at Persistence Press with my good friend, uh, Derek Hibbs. And um, this particular piece is, is a print I made with Derek and I'd recently started collecting these eyewitness accounts of, of folks who had been on the cliffs um, while these cliffs are falling. And um, it's happening at a rapid rate. Um, and so I, I've been collecting all these stories of these eyewitness accounts and layering them onto um, prints. It Does that answer your question? Yes, yes. And I'm okay. looking, um, okay. I'm trying to remember uh, the where the, what the source for the text is, the very like subtle text running in the background of this. Image. Right, right. So I collected those from, from different news stories, mostly earlier, website. Websites, yeah. yeah. Um, earlier when you were describing the live feed camera and you, you said, um, you know, it looks as if this is this is very mundane. Like the video is just like pointed out into this live feed and it's really mundane. And this is one of the images that came into my mind. This mm -hmm. along with some of those um, other cliffs kept falling in. Yeah. And, and I, I, I just feel like your work really has that tension of like, mm -hmm. you there's like this quiet, it might be perceived as mundane. And then um, if you really read what's going on, like whether it's in this subtle text or in the imagery itself, it, it's pretty violent. You know, there, there's kind of a violence that happens in um, the construction even. Right, right. Like, like right. driving past these construction right. sites and right. you think, oh, they're just like fixing the road or, oh, they're just like taking down 10 acres of wetland, you know? So right. it's, it's, it's mundane until you actually begin to piece, take the pieces and put them together into yeah. this larger narrative that you're witnessing on the vanishing coastline, um, which seems like what the scientists, what what Dr. Guza is also doing, um, right, putting together right. these bits and pieces for the complete narrative to see where this is all heading, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, I think it's about looking closely and just sort of paying attention, paying attention. And, and for me, it was actually all started with I'd moved away from California and I would return and always make sure I'd visit the ocean. And I saw the, the coastline changing, not just in development, but in the way that the cliffs looked. I knew exactly what they had looked like in the past. I spent a lot of time around them and near them and on them. And um, there was this particular image I I took um, while standing below this structure, um, which I later found out is Robert's old office, <laughs> which is part oh of UCSD God. campus. And I didn't know that when I took this image. I didn't know him when I took this image. Oh my God. Um, that is yeah. So yeah. And so I was standing below this, this structure and I could see moisture sort of creeping out of the cliff, but then I felt the sand and it was dusting me and I, I just thought how crazy is this like what's happening here this is on the verge of collapse and I think that that's kind of a, a, a sort of metaphor for a lot of our environmental situations right now either they're on the verge or they are already in motion for, mm -hmm. to kind of falling apart um, yeah were there any stories, Adriana, um, this, is a, this is a total curve, curveball question we didn't practice. So um, <laughs> were there any stories during um, quarantine that really um, you loved hearing about, you know, nature coming back in? Like, I feel like there was a, a story um, about the dolphins in Venice coming back into the canal because there yeah. were no, 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 no tourists coming no in. Yeah, I had heard about that too, but then I heard maybe that was a hoax. So oh, really? The internet. Mm -hmm. Oh, well, mm -hmm. gosh. Um, well, 
were there any other stories that maybe were real? <laughs> um, I mean, I know that a lot more people went outdoors, right? Yeah. Um, a lot more people were, were spending time outside. So um, that's an interesting reaction to the pandemic and the, the choices people made to, to like stay entertained, I guess, um, or like have something to do because everything else has been closed. Right. Um, so I guess that's my answer. <laughs> well, you already have some questions coming in. Um, oh, okay. Is there anything um, else that you want to share um, with your, uh, your imagery? Um, I think I was going to close out with the, the, a few images of gradual destruction. Oh, right. As we yes. were talking about technology and, um, and the use of it in my work. And so this particular installation um, is titled Gradual Destruction. And it's made up of, of 256 feet of hand printed, screen printed wallpaper and a uh, hundred sheets of handmade sandpaper. And um, each layer of handmade paper um, kind of represented one annual year of coastal erosion. There was some data that I was reading while I was making this work that was saying that in a hundred years, um, the beaches in Southern California could, dis could, could be gone um, or changed, right? So where there were beaches, the, those sandy beaches may move um, or not be there anymore. Um, and so in this installation, um, these videos were recorded from inside of a microscope. So I'd, I'd taken some of that gathered sand, put it inside of this the microscope and um, recorded this video from inside of it. So this, this, re this recording is, is um, of the sand uh, moving in and out of focus. And I was really interested in the way, it's a slow video, so I'll, I'll speed it up so you can actually see how it kind of moves in and out. Um, the use of the microscope is like an apparatus, like a camera that allows for these microscopic observations of our planet that may otherwise be invisible to the naked eye. And so you can see it's slowly moving to focus. And um, the sand here is made up of, of magnetite, of quartz. Um, and then if you look here, there's a, let's see if it's in focus towards the front. There's a tiny little shell right there. Where, that's a shell. Oh, yeah. Yeah, the oh, tiny little shell. It's like the, um, they're like little slippers is what, <laughs> what, I, I can't, they're like, it's, I'm not, we'll have to, hopefully someone will type it, type Tell us it. what kind of shell that is. Tell us what shell it is. Um, yeah, so I'm interested in the way that, that technology allows us to, to see in ways that the human body can't naturally do on its own. So either from inside of a microscope or from the International Space Station. Oh, yeah. um, I think a lot of these ways of making and, and ways of um, document, documenting and recording um, really allow me to stay connected to the coast and, and to my home. Oh. You're getting some really good questions here. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'm going to stop sharing my screen. No, yeah, were, was oh. that your final image? Yeah, that's it. <laughs> okay. um, all right. So, because it's sort of, I think this question may have been um, inspired by some of some of those uh, final images of work. Okay, I can open it back up if we need to. No, you're good. You're good. Okay. Um, but just about your work with the scientists. So uh, the question is, and I'm sorry, there aren't names attached to these. Um, uh, what is the toughest thing about collaborating with a scientist when you're trying to communicate? Mm -hmm. Do you find you speak the same language or not? So when I met Bob, I had already, kn I had already known about him. And so I was doing a bunch, of re a bunch of research on coastal erosion and was looking for people that were also like talking about it. And I found this... Um, interview with him on the beach talking really passionately about the seriousness of the situation on the coast and I was like oh my god I want to meet this guy like I want to talk to him 
And so that was kind of like where my head was. And um, I left it at that. And then I was home in San Diego and I was visiting um, my really good friend, friend May and her partner had come home from work and I was um, just like catching up with him. And he was telling me about how um, his work included um, erosion control. And I was like, oh, wow. I was like, I'm really interested in erosion. And so we were just, I was kind of like joking to him um, because it was like on my brain a lot at that moment. And then he says, you should meet our friend, Bob. And I'm like, oh, really? Who's Bob? And then they start telling me about this, their friend, Bob, who's a scientist. And so long story short, a few days later, I'm I'm sitting with Bob at his dining room table, um, telling him why, (laughs) why I'm interested in the work that he's doing. And and I think that I had to convince him at first. At first, he was like, why is an artist interested in what I do? Um, and I was like, well, let me tell you something. So I showed him my, my artwork on my website and, and explained just some of the things that I was looking at and thinking about. And um, then from there, um, I was able to, to go back to California and spend some time with him on the coast. And I mean, it's been a, an, a, an amazing experience meeting him and and listening to him um uh talk about the work that he's so dedicated to and the time he spent doing it and the things he that he's seen over the years um so I feel like we just touched the surface of um of our friendship and I'm just really looking forward to getting back out there and spending more time with him and um yeah I hope that answers the question um, good. And, uh, let's see, um, have you, sh- oh yeah. Oh my gosh. So this question is, have you shared your artwork with Dr. Guza? How did he interpret your work through his scientific eyes? You, you started to describe that a little bit, but yeah, I mean, besides being probably surprised that you were interested at all. Yeah. Yeah. And, and to be honest, we haven't had a lot of time with my artwork, but he is, he was going to join tonight and be, and oh, really? um, yeah. And uh, be here for the talk. So I invited him and he said he was going to make it. So he's here somewhere. <laughs> um, That's awesome. Yeah. Most of the time that we've had together has been on the coast and um, talking about the ocean and coastal erosion and sharing lots of emails and um, stuff like that. Um Good. Well, well um, I look forward to meeting him. I hope he'll visit Madison. Um, and one, another question that's related to um, this, I, this, the coastal erosion is um, a question that says, I'm wondering about coastal erosion along the Great Lakes. Um, do you know if it's the same kind of dynamics or different dynamics in the erosion along the lake shores? That's a really good question. I unfortunately have not done any research on the erosion in the Great Lakes. Um, I'm not familiar with the research that's happening there, but if anybody else is in the chat, you should join in. (laughs) Well, you did just get a comment from um, Dr. Guza, Adriana, and he says, (laughs) and and this is is through Jim. So Jim, thank you for posting this. Um, Uh, Dr. Guza says, Adriana sees beaches in a unique way. Hi, Bob. Thank you for being here. That's wonderful. Um, okay, we have another question about, um, th- this is a comment. It says, amazing work, Adriana. How did you first get interested in um, bodies of water? Um, I think I became interested with making work about the ocean. Um, after I moved away from the ocean. So going home and, and seeing, um, like I had said earlier, like really recognizing a lot of these changes happening along the coastline and wanted, wanting to be able to kind of understand it. And one way of understanding it is making art about it, um, being able to kind of work through the, the sorts of um, kind of frustrations that you have about things that are happening in the world, the, the rec- like recognizing the loss that was happening and um yeah so going home and 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 recognizing the changes that were happening really made me want to make work about the, the coastline 
Yes, I, I've always really um, connected to that part of your work and mm. been so fascinated with the um, creative process of that lament, like just the longing for mm. um, that land or the the whatever is missing um, brings you closer to it, right? You're, you, you begin co- like collecting the soil, yeah. bringing it closer to you, traveling mm. with it. I yeah. Mean, I'm yeah. pretty sure I have branches in my um, studio that are from 20 years ago and <laughs> I'm not kidding, but um, you know, this, this, like the, the action that comes out of that longing is, um, is really present in, in your, in your work. Um, and let's see, you have more questions or more comments here. Um, okay. Someone says, it's so interesting to see all of the bits and pieces of the work and how it comes together. I'm looking forward to seeing uh, um, your show again. The, and I think, and they mentioned the all show. Um, oh, right. um, how do you preserve an artwork that involves video uh, mm-hmm. like that? It's not like a traditional painting. So is it ephemeral? Sure, yeah, it totally is ephemeral. I think you could say. Um, I mean, it lives at the, as this like digital file, right? Um, and maybe that is that is gonna break down and disappear as technology changes um, and may not be available at some point in the future. Um, and I, I guess I'm okay with that. Um, has technology affected your work or how has technology affected your work? Well, I think like I mentioned earlier, it allows me to kind of be on the coast. Like these live feed cameras allow me to kind of like peek in and see what's happening at the living shoreline. Um, And I would say technology when it comes to like printmaking or um, these like site specific installations, I would say the, the prints, are a more kind of um, accessible piece of art that you know I could have in my home or someone could have in their home, and um, so that it, it seems easily shareable. And the technology of these installations, because of the way they're made and and that they live in these kind of temporary timelines, um, seem not as accessible, but um yeah like does that I don't know if I answered that yeah it it it's um it's helpful to hear about um the ways that our our perspective changes um through these different technologies and adapting to it you know and just just knowing how um how uh laborious it is to like carry out these processes It, it I think I've you know it can sort of direct the work like the, the failed process or the successful process of mm. lithography or etching or screen printing um, and wallpaper, all of these things, uh, you know, they're kind of moving us and taking us where, where they want us to go. Right. That's a really good, yeah, way to answer that. Yes, exactly. <laughs> but at all, I mean, you <laughs> it's seem totally to, true. You, you pick like the hardest ones, like, and I know you're working Not with, intentional. <laughs> with glass also too, right? Yeah. So, so in, um, I, in the over the summer, you have this residency at Pilchuck, um, and there is a question here about um, other art mediums you're interested in exploring to showcase your work. And I'm wondering if you could speak a little bit to the Pilchuck residency yeah. and the the glass, the practice of 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 printmaking and glass um, that you're that you've done. Yeah, so I have this amazing friend who her name is Anna Lenner. Shout out Anna, um, who I worked with in grad school and. Um, she helped me kind of um, realize these kind of wacky ideas I had about these glass portals um, that I still aren't finished, but um, like through my relationship with Anna and learning about glass, um, I learned about vitriography, which is uh, a technique that is done at Pilchuk and Pilchuk had a call for resident artists um, a few months ago and I applied to it. And so they also, they, they have a printmaking studio um, 
it is a glass craft school and they also have a print shop. And I was really excited about um, the possibility of these like very innovative um, uh, processes coming together and learning more about it. So I'm going in not knowing a lot about vitriography, but knowing a little bit about um, screen printing enamel glass on sheet glass and possibly um, including this vitriography uh, process with some of those techniques and making prints from these glass plates, which is um, how I understand vitriography at this moment. That's excellent. I, I'm really excited, um, Adriana, to see uh, how that residency turns out. Yeah, and I'm super excited about it. Yeah, who knows what will be happening this summer as we- I know, it's move, true. Move through the processes here. Okay, are you ready for this um, comment? Here's a <laughs> comment, comment from Chad Oliver. Long time listener, first time caller, just wanted to give a thumbs, to give a thumbs, uh, to give a thumbs and say hello to Adriana and Emily. And Chad, Adriana has the coolest shirts that you've printed and uh, we're, we're super jealous over here. I so. almost wore it today. Oh man, it, it's you probably have to wash it at this point. I mean, I love it. It's so comfortable. It's, it's like awesome. the perfect material. Yeah, it's really great. Um, okay, uh, now you have a question about future practice, future works. And this hmm. is from Professor Hitchcock wondering, um, what's on the horizon for Adriana? Right. Um, in the calendar is more time with Derek in his shop. Um, we have uh, some plans to work on some more lithographs, make more prints. And then um, now that I have my shop set up here, I'm hoping to bring those prints and um, use, uh, use them with other techniques like screen printing and maybe some paper dyeing. Um, so more prints are right now in, um, insight. Cool. What, uh, what sort of, I'm looking at the equipment back there that, um, I certainly can call out by name, but will you, will you talk, uh, all of our longtime listeners, um, through a little bit of a mini yeah. tour that's in there? Yeah. And the plan for me in the space has always been to, to bring other artists and, people interested in printmaking um, into this space and to make prints together in here. Um, so I'm hoping that that can hopefully happen next year when it's safe to, to be together again. Um, so I have uh, slowly been um, buying things on Facebook marketplace. <laughs> um, that's uh, a washout booth there. Which we do. Um, I didn't buy that on, on Marketplace, but uh, I use that to wash out my screens after I've I'm uh, finished printing. Um, I have a, a light unit here that I'll use to... Um, I like the, the reverse finger, <laughs> in, you know, very printmakerly, right? It's like upside down, reverse and backwards. And then I have a, a very tiny exposure unit that I found on Facebook mar Marketplace that I can um, coat my screens um, print my transparencies on the printer there and then uh, burn my screens here and then wash them out uh, with the washout booth. Um, and then a small uh, vacuum press here and, um, and a dry rack, which is really important for any sort of print shop, right? Yeah, yeah. What, what, is, what have you found to be like the most valuable uh, thing so far that you're, you're like can't live without? My Did flat files. Flat, flat files. <laughs> but that's always like the task of a printmaker, right? You got to keep the paper and the prints safe, right? That's right. Yeah. Happy paper. Yeah. Paper, it, it has its own mind. That's for sure. Um, well, let's see, Adriana. Um, I just want to thank you again for asking me um, to, to be a, a part of this. And um, uh, wonder, let's see, I'm gonna see if I can come up with any more questions for you. If there's any burning burning desires that are gonna um, fly in. Um, uh, there was a comment up here that says, um, where'd it go? Let's see, it says, um, it's like, I love that photograph. How did you make it? <laughs> and 
<laughs> and I just wonder which one, because there's so many beautiful, beautiful um, one, and they were really interested in the edges. So here's the question. Um, how did you take that photograph and make the edges look like that? Ooh, yeah, that oh. was a, the lithograph. I think they're talking about with the text. Oh, right. Um, so I made that um, in Derek's shop. So the original, the, the, the piece started as a photograph taken on a small little body camera, GoPro, mm -hmm. um, which is a sort of wide, gives you that wide angle um, and that sort of fish lens look. Um, and then I took that digital image, put it into Photoshop, created this sort of um, brush-like mark, mm -hmm. um, which is a layer that I put on top of the original image. And with that kind of mark making, I was thinking about um, both the action of erasing and revealing. Um, and then I layered, yeah, so I layered that layer on top of the uh, photograph and turn that into a transparency, which is printed on a large format printer and then burned onto and developed onto a photolitho plate. I hope that's helpful. I know it can yeah. be a little, yeah. So I wasn't counting, but that sounded like at least 10 to 12 um, different steps to make something in the end look so beautiful and effortless. Thank you, Emily. As if Thank it you. Was done with a mark. And, um, and I do think that it's something that, um, you know, it, it, it is such a part of your practice is just that real hard work, like determination, but also the follow through and your willingness to like stay with things. Mm. Um, you're one of the hardest workers I know um, that that uh, can keep up uh, with all the crazy demands of, of this fast paced um, life of an artist. And I just want to um, honor that in you. And Thank you, Emily. I know one of the hard things that that you're working on um, in the background of what's happening in Madison mm. and what's happening in California is also your work that you do in Italy. And there's mm. just a few minutes left, but do you want to speak a little bit to that, um, which I know has been um, sure. an important part of your practice? Yeah, I've been fortunate enough to be part of this amazing um, art school in Florence, Italy. Um, it's called Santa Reparata International School of Art also known as SRISA, S-R-I-S-A. Um, and it's an art school located in the heart of Florence that my, um, my mentor started um, in Italy. Um, he had went out there on a Fulbright and then ended up starting this um, print studio. And then it grew into this, this art school that now um, my very good friend and mentor, Rebecca Olson uh, runs. And um, I was there, I think in the summer of 2019 last time, uh, the last time I was there and, um, and Rebecca had invited me out to um, set up um, sc screen printing facilities in their amazing um, printmaking studio. And so screen printing isn't a very um, common uh, method of printmaking in Florence or from what I could see in Italy. Um, it's definitely used in like the commercial industry, but not in any of the shops there. And so um, I worked all summer to kind of get them set up. Um, they already had the exposure units. They had some screens. They had the beautiful dark room. Um, but I helped them figure out like how to expose these screens. How the, One of the big things was there was a no transparencies, let's just say that. It, there, it wasn't really possible to find the film out there. Um, and then, you know, the emulsion was a whole nother world. That stuff is made in Europe and it's a totally different kind of makeup, chemical makeup, and then the inks are totally different as well. So, um, but it was a super exciting experience and that, that um, Sarisa is a very special place to me. And um, I just hope that one day I can get back out there and and be part of the, the magic that they are um, making out there. And are, do you know how they're they're doing right now, Sarisa? Um, yeah, I think that they're preparing summer virtual workshops. I know that, that if you're interested in book arts, they were just recently promoting on their Instagram um, that uh, Patricia Silva, who's an amazing book artist, is hosting a, a bookmaking class. Um, and then I think they're also doing some language classes um, food and culture, um, but yeah, um, 
I don't, I know it's not been easy for them. You know, as we all know that Italy was um, hit really hard in the pandemic and um, towards the beginning of it. And I think that the cities are still um, having a really hard time coming back. Well, Adriana, thank you so much. Um, we are right at the hour mark and I'm hoping that Jim um, is behind the scenes here um, um, helping us to, uh, to monitor um, the, the, this experience here. Um, but again, thanks so much. And thanks to Art Lab for not only this series of um, visiting artist interviews, um, and artist talks online, but again, just um, that all the work that you do um, in Madison and with the new space and all the upcoming uh, programming. And um, I can say personally, we're excited to um, work with all through UW Madison's printmaking area to help host the International Southern Graphics uh, um, Conference, SGCI, International Conference, that'll be a year from now. Um, almost exactly a year from now yep. uh, with yep. about, I don't know, 1200 printmakers coming into uh, to Madison um, and lots of really exciting um, educational programming around that. And I'm so glad Art Lab and you personally, Adriana, that you are, are such a big part of this. So it's going to be amazing. Yeah. So thank you. Amazing. Thank you, Emily, for, for being here with me today. Thank you for having um, this thoughtful conversation. Um, about my work today. Um, it means so much to be here with you. Um, and thanks again to everyone at all for this awesome time. Yeah, you're welcome, Adriana. And I look forward to seeing all that is to come for you. Thank you, Emily. Thank you.